Oh, it's got something. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. So Len's out of town today. Um, he's in Cuba. Cuba. <laughs> no Cuba doubt, uh, enjoying a mojito down there as we speak. Or cigar shop. Yeah. All right. Um, so we have a topic I'm excited to hear about today from Mike Weiss about uh, adverse reactions to non-beta-lactam antibiotics. This is part one. Um, and um, I want to make sure we get through because you've got some great pictures at the end I want to hear about. So. <laughs> right. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. This year I considered it very successful. Last year when I came here for my talk, I sort of got into a car accident, so I didn't do that this year, so it's a very successful journal club. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, so Len assigned me this topic, and um, there are so many different antibiotics that it's going to be, I think, impossible to do them all justice in one session. So hopefully I'll twist his arm, and next year I'll do the remaining antibiotics. Um, so I don't have a non-conflict slide, but there's no conflicts on this talk, basically. It's going to be information that um, hopefully will be useful to you as a resource. I'm not sure you have to remember every piece of information in terms of adverse reactions from this talk, but you can always go back to it if you have a patient who maybe comes in on an antibiotic who's had some issues that you can refer back to. And this information, you know, obviously the ID people are pretty familiar with uh, their medicines and their adverse reactions to their medicines. So these are the antibiotics that we're not going to be talking about, because this title is for non-beta-lactam antibiotics. And today what I'd like to be able to cover with you is adverse uh, reactions to aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, chloramphenicol, the rifampin group, and metronidazole. And then hopefully next year we'll be able to get through the macrolides, ketolides, clindamycin, vanco, sulfonamides, trimethoprim, quinolones, and nitrofurantin. And even though there's more of them, there's more information on the first set, so we'll, we'll be able to fill a full talk with the, the first group of antibiotics. Uh, and again, for the sake of time uh, constraints, we're going to focus on direct adverse reactions <clears throat> to these antibiotics and not on the multitudes of potential antibiotic drug interactions because we'd never get off one antibiotic if we were basically discussing those. So let's start with the family of aminoglycosides. And <clears throat> it's sort of interesting, if you look back on this family, the first uh, ones were sort of started in the 1940s, and if you go on up to the ones that are used in the United States at least, it stops in uh, 1960. So 50 years ago was the last aminoglycoside that was uh, developed that's used in the United States. You have some that were developed that are uh, more recently in the 1970s, 40 years ago, that are used in other parts of the world but not in the United States. <clears throat> These were fairly commonly used, uh, certainly when I was doing my residency and a whole lot of issues with uh, some of their toxicity, which we'll discuss here. So one of the most common uh, side effects from aminoglycosides is nephrotoxicity, and I think you're all familiar with that. It's an injury to the proximal tube, renal tubes, and it's really uh, an unexplained genetic susceptibility that leads people to have this increased risk. Um, your incidence is between 5 and 25 percent, with some studies going as high as 50 percent, and some studies saying, well, we've never seen it sort of thing. Uh, there are certain factors that will make nephrotoxicity more likely, and you should be aware of those. Uh, certainly, depending on which aminoglycoside is being used with Neomycin being the worst player in just about every category we're going to talk about. Uh, genomycin less so, and streptomycin even less so. Um, the more frequent that you dose the aminoglycoside, the more likely to run into nephrotoxicity. Older age, volume or sodium depletion is a risk factor. The larger doses can be an increased risk factor. The longer you treat someone greater than three days, the more likely you're going to run into nephrotoxicity. And then depletion of uh, uh, magnesium and uh, calcium, uh, um, potassium, uh, liver disease. And then there are certain medicines that patients are on make their risk of nephrotoxicity uh, much higher. And I've listed these um, concomitant medications here. 
if patients are getting aminoglycosides and then need a study with uh, radio contrast, their risk of nephrotoxicity also goes up. Um, so what happens if you have a patient and you're starting to see deterioration of renal function? Well, the treatment is basically as quickly as you can, discontinue the aminoglycoside, and usually if you catch it quickly, renal recovery usually occurs. Um, you know, you know, again, I remember uh, back in residency measuring aminoglycoside blood levels, and there are two reasons to do that. Peak levels sort of basically are there to ensure that the uh, antibiotic has good activity against the bug, so you're getting good peak levels to kill the bacteria. And trough levels are more for toxicity, and if you're starting to see high trough levels, then you may want to adjust the dose because it suggests that you may have impaired renal clearance and can have some increased risk of nephrotoxicity. Another common uh, side effect with aminoglycosides is ototoxicity. And a um, cousin of mine went deaf when he was a young kid because of aminoglycoside uh, ototoxicity. Uh, it can cause both uh, cochlear and vestibular damage, um, is usual but not always reverse, uh, irreversible. Uh, can occur at the end of aminoglycoside treatment, and again, cumulative dose increases the risk. Um, fortunately, it's unusual to have both odo and nephrotoxicity in the same patient. Um, so cochlear toxicity, uh, a few um, recipients of aminoglycoside therapy may complain of hearing loss, uh, and the recorded incidence is as high as 62% when asymptomatic high-frequency audiograms are performed repeatedly on patients on aminoglycoside. So fairly significant numbers have some hearing effects, even if they don't notice it. Um, the overall incidence has been reported to be between 3 and 14%, um, and a hearing threshold of 25 to 30 decibels is necessary before the patient is aware that they're having any hearing deficit. Uh, unfortunately, that means that considerable cochlear damage can occur without patient really even recognizing it. It's also difficult for audiologists, uh, particularly in ill patients, sort of to test them uh, in, for hearing, and many of the audiometers uh, don't even test for frequencies uh, beyond 8 uh, gigahertz. Uh, hurts. So an ill patient who may not be able to sort of do an audiogram is at higher risk of having ototoxicity here from aminoglycoside. Uh, the mechanism for this damage has not really been detected. Um, there is some evidence that aminoglycosides can induce apoptotic cell death in cells of both the organ of Corti and vestibular apparatus. Um, and it's uh, felt that this is due to drug-induced formation of free radicals that sort of promote this uh, cell death. Um, the greatest risk probably, again, is genetic predisposition. There have been, unfortunately, numerous reports of deafness that have developed in uh, multiple family members after treatment with aminoglycoside. So again, uh, genetic susceptibility. Um, another sort of piece of data for genetic susceptibility is certain uh, species of monkeys. Macaque monkeys uh, are resistant to aminoglycoside otocochlear toxicity, whereas uh, patas monkeys are very sensitive to this uh, adverse effect. Um, they've sort of identified a specific mu mutation in the 12S mitochondria RNA. And this locus is uh, consistent with the matrilineal pattern of inheritance. And it's an A to G substitution and nucleotide position, 1555. And uh, again, toxicity along with this genetic susceptibility, like nephrotoxicity, is somewhat dose and duration of uh, treatment dependent. So higher dose and longer treatment, higher risk, basically, along with the genetic susceptibility. Um, you can have unilateral as well as, unfortunately, bilateral uh, cochlear toxicity. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes the injury occurs uh, well after termination of the aminoglycoside is finished. Um, and it's, again, as I mentioned already, it's independent of vestibular injury and uh, nephrotoxicity. Um, and for, again, this toxicity, cumulative dose and duration seems to be more important than sort of 
peak serum concentrations. Um, the risk of toxicity may go up if patients come into aminoglycosides with some renal impairment ongoing because, again, um, their levels uh, tend to go up uh, if their kidneys are not excreting the drug. Again, certain aminoglycosides are bad players compared to others, and neomycin uh, is particularly a bad player in terms of cochlear toxicity, no matter how it's delivered, whether it's oral, intraperitoneal, topical on open wounds, bladder irrigation, which these have been used for before, uh, are all particularly hazardous neomycin for cochlear damage. Um, and again, high frequency hearing loss can occur without any symptoms, without the patient being aware of it. And then you can have, unfortunately, very sudden uh, conversational hearing loss can occur without any warning. Um, there are reports of some patients sort of feeling some fullness in the ear, or hearing a little tinnitus, but this is not universal. Uh, but there is a feeling that if your patients report any sort of symptoms related to the ear, it may be um, some early signs of toxicity. It may be worth you know, considering switching antibiotics if possible. So could it happen with Neosporin? I mean, how much would you have to put on? <laughs> Depends how open your wound is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, why is it still on the market then? Um, it's, I mean, it's probably used frequently in, you know, for wounds that are pretty small. And, right. Uh, yeah. So I think it's unlikely. Yeah. Although it's not an antibiotic that I don't think many of us prescribe, but it's over the counter, and patients come in with issues sometimes from it. Yeah. There is a uh, rarer sort of. Um, Fortunately, um, adverse effect from aminoglycosides, which is neuromuscular blockade. And it is rare, but it's uh, very serious and can be potentially uh, lethal. Um, so again, neomycin becomes the big, you know, bad player here, but it can be uh, seen in any of these other aminoglycosides listed, which is pretty much all of them. Um, and again, it can occur independent of the route of administration of the aminoglycoside, and I've, again, listed all of the different routes that have been reported for this adverse effect, this neuromuscular blockade. Um, it often uh, occurs in clinical situations uh, where there may be another uh, medication that has sort of interferes with neuromuscular transmission. Patients may have received d 2 book curarine or succinylcholine or other sort of agents that sort of block the neuromuscular transmission. Um, and a rapid rise in aminoglycoside levels, very quick rises, seem to be a risk factor in developing this side effect. Um, so you can have weakness of respiratory musculature, flaccid paralysis, dilated pupils, deep tendon reflexes can be anything you want, basically, Hy hypoactive, absent, or present. Um, low magnesium, low calcium, uh, and potentially being on calcium channel blockers seem to amplify the risk of this neuromuscular blockade. Um, it seems to inhibit the uh, presynaptic release of acetylcholine as well as the blockage of postsynaptic receptors uh, sites for acetylcholine. And they've tried treatment with uh, neostigmine and it's had very variable results, so it's not a universally accepted treatment for success here. Um, it does see that, seem that you can uh, have, prevent this by having intravenous infusions that are more prolonged. So the more rapid the infusion, the more at risk you are for this neuromuscular blockade. So you'd like to have your infusions for at least uh, 30 minutes or longer and not a bolus infusion. Uh, particularly so in patients who are receiving a large dose during, you know, once a day. So you still want to give that dose over at least 30, 45 minutes or so. So we're going to transition from aminoglycosides adverse effects to the tetracycline family. And we have um, four that are uh, available, the uh, old short-acting one, tetracycline, hydrochloric, uh, HCL, uh, longer acting agents, doxycycline and minocycline. I myself was on a couple of months of doxycycline for malaria prophylaxis when I went to Africa, so I opted for that one. Um, and I might not have if I had done this talk before. <laughs> but you gotta, you gotta be on something. Um, and then we have a tigacycline, which is given intravenously only. Um, 
So after medications come out, there's post-marketing you know, marketing studies, and sometimes then the FDA comes out with some other sort of warnings or sort of letting people know. And they did come out with a warning for tigacycline, saying that there's an increased risk. This is a pretty broad statement. Increased risk of death with tigacycline compared with any other antibiotic used to treat similar <laughs> infections. So not, not the best sort of warning you'd like to see on a medicine you may have to prescribe to someone. Did they say why? Yeah. It's just, it's sort of just, you know, a case control study sort of basically. Yeah. So very common uh, hypersensitivity reactions can occur. You can see anything from anaphylaxis to urticaria to edema to fixed drug eruptions, the typical morbilliform rashes. You know, they do occur, but they're not all that common. Um, it is considered that if a patient has had an allergic reaction to one of the agents, that they probably should not be given one of the uh, different uh, tetracycline family. There have been reports of SLE-like syndromes in association, particularly with minocycline. Um, these patients do develop ANAs. Um, symptoms usually disappear in most patients when you discontinue uh, the uh, antibiotic, minocycline, but if they were rechallenged, typically SLE symptoms uh, return again. And the antibodies dissipate with uh, stopping the uh, minocycline. A lot of photosensitivity and pigment changes, as I think uh, many of you are aware. Uh, there's photosensitivity reactions, uh, reaction on the medicine to sun-exposed areas, uh, often associated with oncolysis, where the nail separates from the nail bed. Uh, very common in patients uh, receiving particularly uh, democycline, but can occur with any of the tetracycline families. Uh, prolonged administration, particularly minocycline, can cause uh, nail skin and scleral pigmentation, which is usually reversible, uh, but you'll get uh, often a non-reversible uh, asymptomatic black pigmentation of the thyroid, which is usually discovered just on pathology. Basically, someone needs their thyroid nodule taken out or a thyroid biopsy, and if they've been on this antibiotic, there's a black pigmentation to the thyroid. Again, asymptomatic doesn't damage the thyroid, but it just changes the color. Um, and there's also uh, a blue or black, blue-black sort of discoloration of the gums, which has uh, also been reported, and this appears to be secondary to bone pigmentation which is visible through the oral mucosal tissue. And this pigmentation is also permanent and would be, you know, obviously visually not desirable to the patient. Um, there are very specific effects on teeth and bones with the tetracycline family. There's a sort of gray-brown to yellow discoloration of the teeth that's been noted in children taking this class of antibiotics. These side effects are permanent uh, and also seem to be associated with hypoplasia of the enamel. Um, so the darkening effects are, uh, appear on um, permanent teeth. Uh, it seems to be related to the total dose of the tetracycline family administered. The primary teeth are show it more uh, because the secondary teeth are larger, thicker, and, and more opaque. So they, they don't show as much, but they still will show. So because of this sort of variable and staining, um, uh, it's basically considered uh, better to not administer these agents to pregnant women and to children uh, below the age of six, because uh, eight, I'm sorry, because that's the period of time when the enamel is being formed on the teeth. Once the enamel's formed, then that discoloration would not occur. Uh, there are some GI symptoms that patients on tetracyclines are prone to getting, um, particularly esophageal ulcerations um, that often people will complain of very severe retrosternal pain. Um, and tetracycline, doxycycline are the most common. Many of the times you'll, you know, these patients may be taking this once or twice a day, and people seem to be particularly vulnerable to the side effect if they take it in capsule form, don't drink a lot, don't eat, and go lie down, basically, at the end of the day. And that seems to be where you're most prone to this sort of esophageal erosion. So, it's, again, it's considered good form to eat, 
eat something with it and don't lie down soon after you take your tetracycline class uh, capsule. Um, other GI side effects from tetracycline uh, can occur, nausea, vomiting, GI upset, uh, often dose related, um, can occur with any of the analogs. Um, so administration of food with doxycycline and minocycline may ameliorate some of these symptoms, but food can sort of decrease the absorption of some of the other tetracycline. So again, it's important to know uh, which one sort of can be taken with food without minimizing the absorption. <coughs> Diarrhea can occur um, and it does it seem to affect the enteric flora of the, the colon as many antibiotics can. Usually this will be totally reversed when you stop the antibiotic, uh, but there have been prolonged cases with the tetracycline family with pseudomembranous colitis have been reported. Um, Tetracycline and then this tigacycline, the IV form, has been reported to cause pancreatitis, uh, sometimes and associated with uh, hepatitis as well. So I don't know if that's the increased risk right there. Um, tetracycline can have adverse effects on the liver. Um, hepatotoxicity has been reported uh, with all of the analogs. Um, and if you look at it pathologically, there's this fine droplet fatty infiltration of the liver, and unfortunately that does result in a high mortality rate. Um, administration of uh, less than two grams a day is generally not associated with any of this liver uh, toxicity, uh, except in pregnant women who are particularly at risk for this sort of liver toxicity. Uh, or in patients who have very, very high levels because of renal failure and they're not excreting the medication. We've already talked that unless there's no other choice, probably pregnant women are not a good candidate for this drug anyway because of their kids having you know, teeth that are gonna be stained, uh, but, um, but they're particularly at risk for the fatty liver uh, infiltration. Um, and don't see, seem to see this with doxycycline, so that's sort of good. There are some uh, rare central nervous system side effects of tetracycline. Uh, vertigo seems to be unique to minocycline, so if your patients are on minocycline for various reasons and complain of that, it's probably related to the, or may be related to the medication. Lightheadedness, loss of balance, dizziness, tinnitus may occur on the second or third day of therapy. And again, for reasons that are unclear, uh, women are at higher risk than men for that side effect. Um, seem to be totally reversible uh, when you discontinue the minocycline. You can get benign intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri has been described in both infants and adults uh, with the various different analogs. Uh, patients may first start complaining of headache after using the tetracyclines and if they do, uh, they should have a very careful exam with special attention to their visual fields and formal testing uh, with fundoscopy to look for papilledema, and you should you know, stop the antibiotic immediately if that occurs. So we're gonna switch from the tetracycline family to chloramphenicol, uh, developed in 1949, um, and very quickly uh, started having reports of aplastic anemia. And it sort of fell into disuse in the United States because of that. But because it's rel rel readily available overseas, and often it's over the counter in many countries, and it does have a very <clears throat> broad spectrum of activity, it's good for gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, anaerobes, spirochetes, rickettsia, chlamydia, mycoplasma, and it has really good tissue penetration. It's inexpensive. So it's still used as a first-line therapy in many you know, parts of the world for enteric fever, fever and other infections. So although not used that much in the United States, it's still you know, a player in the rest of the world. Um, it does even in the United States have a, a, a utility, but again, generally only as an alternative therapy in very, very seriously ill patients and for patients infected with organisms that are highly resistant to other antibiotics. Um, it may be, you know, if we had an anthrax scare or something like that, or bioterrorism, you know, you might see more chloramphenicol. 
being used. So there are two types of uh, sort of bone marrow sort of issues that can occur. Um, the most common is a, fortunately a reversible bone marrow depression uh, that's related pharmacologically to the antibiotic and it seems to occur because of inhibition of mitochondrial protein synthesis. Um, you can get decreased in pretty much any of the uh, blood forming units um, or any combination of those. Um, it's extremely common this toxicity, it occurs during the course of therapy and seems to be dose related. Um, it does occur in patients receiving, uh, more likely to occur in patients receiving four grams a day or more or whose serum levels rise over 25 uh, micrograms per milliliter which uh, can occur in patients who have severe liver disease or who are receiving higher than normal doses. And this form of depression of the bone marrow forming units fortunately is reversible when the antibiotic is uh, discontinued. Unfortunately, there's a second type of uh, damage to the bone marrow which is uh, not reversible. It's uh, a fatal idiosyncratic response. Um, and it's sort of, at one time when chloramphenicol was first discovered and being used more commonly before this side effect sort of came to full knowledge, it was the most common cause of aplastic anemia in the United States. Um, so according to the best epidemiologic studies, uh, aplastic anemia will occur uh, once in every 24,000 to 40,000 uh, patients who receive this antibiotic. So it's a risk of about 13 times greater than that for aplastic anemia in the general population who have never received chloramphenicol. Um, the other problem is uh, it often occurs weeks to months after the completion of the therapy. And this particular idiosyncratic sort of non-reversible form is not necessarily dose related. So measuring blood levels and such uh, don't sort of protect you from this potential uh, irreversible aplastic anemia side effect. Um, and it seems to be a mechanism that's different than sort of the direct bone marrow suppression that uh, we talked about uh, with the reversible form. And the exact pathogenesis of this idiosyncratic um, response is really not fully known. It does again have a genetic tendency in that this toxicity has occurred in identical twins receiving chloramphenicol. Um, interesting, um, it seems to uh, be greater after oral therapy, although it is seen it with parental therapy, but it is higher uh, incidence with uh, oral therapy. Um, so again, most of these cases do become apparent after the drug is already finished, uh, although 22%, so about a quarter of the cases, or one-fifth of the cases, uh, start occurring while the drug is still being administered. Um, so there's been a debate, and it's really unclear if it's useful to, but there's a debate when patients are on chloramphenicol, should people be you know, checking blood counts and how often to check blood counts. And the general rule of thumb is recommended that um, you should be checking blood counts twice a week if patients are on chloramphenicol. If white blood cell counts decrease below 2,500, uh, you might want to discontinue that antibiotic if at all possible. But again, since the majority of the fatal idiosyncratic cases don't occur until the drug is already finished, what you're probably picking up are the reversible ones anyway with, with you know, measuring this, but it still is recommended. So, so you know the rates of, um, it's like 25,000 to 40,000, what is it worldwide? You know, if it's being used in other parts of the country, do they see it, or is it a more a genetic thing with... Yeah, I don't think there's that good epidemiologic data. There are agencies that are collecting that worldwide, and it's over the counter, so it's hard to monitor. So there isn't worldwide data for that. Yeah. But it, I, I imagine it probably is there, you know, with some vari the variability is 24 to 40. You know, maybe you're genetically going to get one in 40,000, or maybe you're going to get one in 24,000. Um, chloramphenicol can also induce Ray Baby Syndrome for the pediatricians in the room. 
Um, it's uh, generally a syndrome of neonates, uh, and you get abdominal distension, vomiting, plasticity, cyanosis, and a circulatory collapse, and usually death. Um, it's basically the result of the neonate's uh, diminished ability to conjugate chloramphenicol and to excrete it in its active form in the urine. Um, and if it's needed, if chloramphenicol is needed in premature infants and neonates, the dose should be reduced to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day, and the antibiotic level should be closely monitored. Um, this uh, syndrome has also been seen, <coughs> although not as often, in toddlers and also in adults in accidental overdoses. So you have to take pretty high doses in adults to see this. Um, you'll see it more often if you get uh, chloramphenicol levels greater than 50 micrograms per milliliter. And also may be seen with unexplained metabolic acidosis seems to accompany this. Um, and what it happens is this um, inability to conjugate and excrete causes an impairment in myocardial contractility related to drug direct interference of the myocardial tissue, respiration, and oxidative phosphorylation, basically, so the muscle doesn't work. Uh, they've tried large volume exchange transfusions and uh, charcoal hemoperfusion uh, to try and get rid of the uh, inactivated metabolite as quickly as possible with variable results, but that's pretty much all that you can try, you know, if that occurs. Why are they great? I think they're cyanotic. Yeah, blue grape. Yeah, you're just not, you're not oxygenating, basically. Yeah. You can get a, a, a optic neuritis with chloramphenicol, uh, decreased visual acuity uh, with patients who have received chloramphenicol for a while. Uh, usually these are reversible, but there have been reported cases of uh, loss of vision that's not reversible. Uh, there are some other weird, unusual uh, neurologic side effects that have been reported with chloramphenicol, including uh, peripheral neuritis, depression, ophthalmoplegia, mental confusion, rare cases, but can, you know, can occur. So if we have, we have bioterrorism and a lot of people are on chloramphenicol, you know, you got to be aware of these. Uh, so we're going to switch gears and talk about the family, uh, the rifamycins. Uh, these guys were discovered, again, if the, the theme here is there haven't been a ton of new antibiotics in the last 15 years or so, so, you know, when we talk about some of these guys, we're talking about 50, 60 years ago, you know, being invented. Um, so there's a class of um, these antibiotics that are called the rifamycin complex. Rifampin was approved first uh, for use in the United States in 1971. Again, primary use pulmonary tuberculosis, but also for a meningococcal carriage and sort of for exposure uh, for people who have been exposed potentially to meningococcal disease. Uh, there are semi-synthetic analogs, uh, which have different pharmacokinetic properties and some differences in sort of anti-microbiological activities. Um, and you have rifabutin, rifapentin, and rifamyxin. Again, slightly different pharmacokinetics, slightly different sort of uh, antibacterial coverage. Uh, they're very broad spectrum agents. Uh, greatest activity is against mycobacterium and gram positive uh, organisms. Um, so, again, there are some side effects that are associated with this class of antibiotics. There isn't any medicine that doesn't have some adverse effects that could occur. Uh, but fortunately for this class, they're relatively low. 1.9% uh, has been sort of generally reported. Um, a lot of times it's felt that these medicines are discontinued, potentially unnecessarily so, because the side effects were fairly minimal. Uh, the most common is GI symptoms, abdominal pain, cramping, nausea, vomiting. I guess it's minimal if you're prescribing it and not minimal if you're taking it. Uh, diarrhea. Um, with any of the rifamycins. Um, and that's probably the most common reason that that class of antibiotic is uh, discontinued. There have been rare cases, um, again, not too surprising, of causing uh, pseudomembranous colitis from C. difficile, although not that many. There are some hepatic side effects from the rifamycin class of uh, antibiotics. There, are some, there often are some mild, very transient, not to worry, uh, mild elevations of bilirubin, often very quickly after you start rifamycin. 
um, and it's felt that it inhibits the excretion of bilirubin and really don't have to worry about that. Um, more, more bothersome is some people will get elevations of the serum uh, hepatic transaminases uh, when they're getting uh, rifapenem and other rifamycin antibiotics. Uh, it's relatively low side effect. Uh, highest rates are reported in people who already have some underlying liver disease or may have some predisposing condition such as alcohol overuse uh, or are taking other medications that are difficult for the liver to handle. Um, they did a meta-analysis looking at this sort of side effect and patients receiving uh, rifampin without isoniazide, it was very low, 1.1%. And uh, usually spontaneous resolution uh, of the transaminase elevations occur even if you continue with the uh, rifampin. Um, there can be some more severe hepatitis uh, that does actually require discontinuation, so you have to follow those transaminase levels if they're going up. They sort of stabilize and you know, go up twofold and then sort of come down or stay there, you're okay. But if they keep rising, the recommendation is to discontinue the uh, antibiotic. Um, there's definitely higher incidence in uh, patients who are on other, again, drugs that may be difficult for the liver to, to handle here. Um, you can have some unusual hematologic sort of abnormalities, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, granulocytopenia, are relatively common during rifampin therapy. Um, most of the time these are mild and generally um, are reversible and you know you just notice a mild depression and can keep going. Um, usually there's, you don't need to really do a whole lot. Um, but there are some more severe hematologic complications, uh, particularly hemolytic anemia and occasionally very significant thrombocytopenia. Um, this appears to be uh, related to a rifampin-dependent antibody production, which then activates complement and causes cell damage through the interaction with the I antigen, which is expressed on the surface of the erythrocytes and platelets. So this is very much in similar to Galen Coombs type 2 sort of immunologic reaction, if you would. Um, these sort of occur during highly intermittent therapy, so starting, stopping, starting, stopping, uh, and often on the reintroduction <clears throat> after the patient has developed these rifampin-induced antibodies, uh, very quickly uh, will they develop this hemolytic anemia or thrombocytopenia. Um, it, and it's usually associated very quickly with uh, fever, uh, joint muscle pain, malaise, headache, and then often acute renal failure may occur as well. Um, so again, if you see that, those symptoms after intermittent therapy particularly, um, I would uh, very quickly discontinue the medication because if you don't, you can run into some pretty serious uh, problems. Um, the um, in the sort of thrombocytopenia, usually the platelet counts will begin to decrease within hours after the readministration of the rifampin. And again, it's not uh, considered a good, good form to rechallenge these uh, patients who have uh, had hemolytic anemia or thrombocytopenia before because uh, you're generally going to get an accelerated form of that reaction if you give it to them again. Um, similarly, with the same antibodies, you can have renal failure um, with, the, again, usually intermittent administration of the rifampin. Um, and again, you'll often see very similar symptoms, fevers, chills, myalgias, nausea, vomiting after the reintroduction. And it's pretty much the same autoantibodies that, uh, that rifampin-induced antibodies that seem to occur here with the acute renal failure that occur with the thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia. And this often leads to acute tubular necrosis uh, or interstitial uh, nephritis here. Um, so I think this, yeah, this goes just about what I was talking about. Uh, Rifampins can also cause a uveitis, which I was not aware of before. Um, so often
often, again, these are used for uh, treatment of mycobacterium type infections, and uveitis typically uh, will occur with acute onset of unilateral or sometimes bilateral eye pain, a very acute redness, and decreased visual acuity. Usually it's the anterior chamber that's involved. Um, the onset can be one to four months after you start therapy, and again, people are often on these uh, rifampin antibiotics for months and months at a time for the treatment that they're being given it for. Uh, but there have been reports of uveitis that have occurred as long as 14 months after the introduction of the rifampin. Um, the mechanism for the uveitis is not fully understood. Uh, if you diagnose it early uh, and get treated and discontinue, then usually uh, it's reversible treatments with topical corticosteroids and uh, cycloplegics, um, and usually total reversible and full recovery of uh, vision. Um, I, I don't understand this, you know, reading is that you can go ahead and reintroduce this, uh, and it's thought to be safe, but you can get uveitis again, so I guess, <laughs> but, you know, I guess if you know it's coming, you stop it sooner, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I don't know if I would go there. Um, so you can have increased risk of this side effects, this uveitis, if these patients are receiving certain other medications, particularly chloramphenicol, fluconazole, basically other drugs that can cause an increase in the uh, rifabutin levels, basically, so they impair the excretion. Um, so the reported incidence of this has sort of varied, um, again, varied based on the drug, uh, itself on the dose and the concomitant administration. So they've looked at some studies with rifabutin alone as monotherapy at a dose of 300 milligrams a day for the prevention of MAC disease in patients with uh, AIDS. And there were no reported uh, incidents at this dose um, with uveitis. On another study where they were given 600 milligrams, so twice the amount, in combination with clarithromycin uh, and ethambutol for the treatment for MAC bacteremia. So again, not for prophylaxis, but they basically have the infection in the bloodstream. Uh, the incidence of uveitis was 43%, so from zero to 43%, depending on the dose concomitant sort of drugs that are being given. After those patients had their dose of rifabutin reduced from 600 to 300 milligrams a day, which is now the current recommended dose, so most people are not going up to 600 milligrams a day, uh, it appeared that the risk of uh, uveitis went from 43% uh, percent down to 13%, but still higher than 0% because of the concomitant use of the other medications that were being used to treat the bacteremia. Um, you can get cutaneous side effects from this class of antibiotics, uh, from the whole host of maculopapular rashes, urticaria, erythema, um, and it is probably one of the more common causes for discontinue of rifampin. Uh, by some people feel unnecessarily because these rashes often will wane and uh, not continue, but uh, most common cause for it being discontinued in New York City for treatment for tuberculosis. Um, so sometimes, you know, if you need to, you can use antihistamines if it's a mild uh, uh, cutaneous reaction and the patient's really needed uh, reports of desensitization with these drugs have been reported and there's protocols for those. Um, you can get a drug-induced lupus syndrome with uh, rifamycins. Um, with sort of the standard daily doses, the 300, you know, milligrams. Um, but it often is seen uh, in patients who are receiving other medications that will inhibit the CYP enzyme, which is responsible for the metabolism. So again, by giving the same dose, but a concomitant medication, the levels of the rifamycin class are going up. And usually, um, if you discontinue the rifamycin, um, the anti-nuclear antibodies usually decline and the symptoms dissipate of the lupus-like syndrome. You can get an influenza-like syndrome with this class. Um, and again, that's usually with very, very high doses. Again, the normal dose now is considered 300 milligrams a day, and these folks were getting uh, greater than 1,200 milligrams a day. 
um, and it's felt to be a de rifamycin dependent antibody mediated process that causes this influenza like syndrome. It occurs very quickly. Uh, fevers, rigors, headache, arthralgias, myalgias uh, may last uh, 8 to 10 hours. Um, and changing to a lower dose usually prevents uh, this uh, effect from continuing. Um, and there can be, with this, this whole rif rifampin can cause an orange-red sort of discoloration of tears and sweat and urine and other bodily fluids. So you have to mention that to uh, patients if they're on that, because otherwise you can stain clothing and contact lenses and all sorts of other stuff. So, good. So metronidazole is the last antibiotic class we're going to talk about uh, this session. Um, it's extremely active and a well-tolerated drug. It penetrates tissue well. Uh, to penetrate central nervous system, it's used to treat anaerobic and bacterial infections. It's active against helobacter, uh, amoeba, amoeba, guardia, trichomonas. It's used for Crohn's disease and prophylaxis for uh, surgery below the diaphragm. Uh, so, you know, basically used for a lot of uh, uh, infectious and prophylactic treatments. It's generally very well tolerated. Um, there are uh, interesting report of accidental tenfold overdose uh, occurring in uh, young kids with no adverse effects. Uh, there are some very rare uh, reports of unusual central nervous system side effects, but these are you know fairly low numbers. And uh, like two cases had acute onset of ataxia, dysarthria, and they did find lesions of the cerebellar dentate nucleus have been described that were all reversible after discontinuing the drug. There's been some reports of peripheral neuropathy uh, who have received uh, metronidazole. Um, and again, it's usually reversible once the antibiotic is discontinued. Other sort of neurologic sort of symptoms have been reported from headache to dizziness, syncope, vertigo, um, confusion. Um, there's been a reports of uh, psychosis, uh, a patient who was on metronidazole that was totally <coughs> reversed when the metronidazole was discontinued. Um, so if you have someone who's on it and has any sort of unusual, weird neurologic sort of symptoms or complaints, I would discontinue that medication quickly. Uh, the most so common side effect with metronidazole is GI and the typical things that we've seen before, but also can occasionally cause pancreatitis and hepatitis. Uh, patients often will complain of an unpleasant metallic taste, sort of like the erythromycin taste that uh, a lot of other patients will complain of. You can get sort of a glossitis and a stomatitis uh, and may get a uh, thrush in the mouth. Uh, there are some allergic reactions that have been described, although not very often. Again, from urticaria to maculopapular rashes to flushing to bronchospasm and rare reports of serum sickness. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, transient darkening of the urine with metronidazole. Uh, you can have cystitis, dysuria, incontinence. Uh, again, all fairly low incidence, sort of case report type levels. Nothing that, you know, there's percentages for. Uh, rare reports of uh, reversible neutropenia. Uh, disulfiram should not be given either topically or uh, systemically when metronidazole is being given as acute psychotic reactions have been reported uh, with that, which I was not aware of. Um, what about the antibiotic side effects? With metronidazole? Yeah. Alone? I thought it did. Yeah, that's I thought you had to warn not to drink alcohol. 25 first can yeah. There you go. <laughs> what is that one? If you drink alcohol, it has an abuse like effect. That's in the in the depth. Yeah. We were supposed to not drink alcohol. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I have a few slides here. We have a few minutes from my trip to Botswana this uh, October. So this is the king of the beast here, uh, king of the jungle and getting a little angry. Uh, pretty impressive <laughs> critters. Like some tetracycline. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he might have. Yeah. 
tried to order a patient wanted me to get him some tetracycline and it's no longer manufactured. Is that right? You can get doxy and minocycline, but you can no longer get tetracycline. <laughs> when was this, Paul? About a week ago, I asked the pharmacist and he said they can't order it anymore. They can't get it. Well, it seems like from time to time, antibiotics go in and out of production for various reasons, whether it's an economic decision or an FDA plan sort of issue where they have you know, some issues with the plant and there's a temporary production lag. I was not aware of that particular well, one recently with tetracycline. Did they say is it permanent? Do they well, the pharmacist didn't know. Right. They can still get doxy and minocycline, but they can no longer get tetracycline. I mean, a couple of years back, we couldn't get PNG. You know, it's hard to get PNG places. Um, and there's a huge shortage in some of the, you know, agents that are being used for conscious sedation and such. And so there's some real production issues. I just thought that was so yeah. weird that you yeah. sort of have this drug forever and all of a sudden you just Forever. Yeah, that is. Yeah. So a few other pictures. We'll let you guys go. Um, came across a leopard in the... Sun, sundown time in Botswana in the tree. And these are the most wonderful critters, I think, in the world, these elephants. They're socially dynamic and uh, seem to have these big, big souls and communicate in ways that are unfathomable, to, to me at least. This is a newborn with mom um, and a, a different leopard on a different day who had taken a, a baby warthog for a meal. Uh, so I didn't want to show that. How did you get, what kind of lens are you using to get that? I had a Sony NEX with, uh, I think, 255 lens. Nice. Yeah. Um, we came across this elephant in a river, and we were in a boat, and we sort of got him a little upset, and he told us he was a little <laughs> upset. But very cool critter. And then at nighttime, uh, came back to finding where that line was bedding down. And then the sunsets in Africa are pretty cool. So, so next year, hopefully, we'll get to these antibiotics, and I'll, uh, I'll learn something from the, the group here again. So, thanks.